in this place we give you glory we pour out our praise to you tonight and we honor you for the opportunity to come back tonight online and in person to give your name the praise we bless you for your presence we bless you for healing and we bless you for dwelling and father right now we thank you for what you've done we thank you for what you're going to do now unclutter the minds of every person that's watching and sitting in this room that we may bring fresh answers to questions we give your name the praise and we give you all the glory in jesus name everybody come on clap your hands give god glory can you do that before you take your seat why don't you just say hello to two or three people tell them who you are and just say hey my name is so and so and so and so and all that good beautiful stuff can you do that Yeah, introduce yourself to the people that are around you. It's a beautiful thing. Did we not enjoy the praise and worship team and the prayer team? Can we, can we give God glory for them? Come on, church. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Bless God for the worship experience. The, my ugly sweater wouldn't let me praise because y'all know I like to really praise and while I was praising, my sweater was falling apart but I want my prize, so I want my prize first and then I'll praise him to the sweater come apart, but praise God. I'm, I honor you tonight. I honor our guests that are here tonight. If you clap your hands for them, I'm gonna introduce them shortly. They're really not guests. <laughs> they go to the church, <laughs> but they are guests to the wheel and I wanna thank them for taking time. There's a couple of things I wanna go over real quickly before we move into our conversation. In our conversation, we've got all our questions that you sent in and we're gonna to try to get through those as quickly as possible. And then uh, one of my guests has to leave. Uh, but if there's any other questions, we'll try to fill them within a certain amount of time. I wanna show you something real quick before we move. Those of you that are watching online, I want you to log in. I want you to look. Uh, do we have it? Okay, it's coming, they said. What we can do while it's coming, uh, where's Pastor? Um, Brother Anthony, can you come please for me? While I'm waiting on that, if we can set these chairs up for, for them and y'all can come while we're waiting. I don't want to waste any of the time. Clap your hands for Dr. Natasha. <laughs> Jay Barnett. And this is Dr. Brittany, one of our own that's in the wheel. Come on, come on. I want to give you a snapshot. Y'all can be seated. Uh, I'm going to give you a snapshot real quick of what this year has been for us. Uh, it's been a very difficult year with COVID-19, but I want you to take a look at it. Uh, worship, connect, serve, and invite. That's our four phases of culture. And those of you that are watching online, I want you to see we had a total of 18 worship experiences. And with those from January to April, you all couldn't come because it was closed and we could only use, uh, volunteers could only come. So from May, June, July, August, September, October, whatever the, whatever the order is or the months, up until now, those are the experiences that we've had. When we first started out, we were trying to do two a month and we were trying to do two online interviews a month. Uh, we had some trouble. so. When we first cast the vision for the, for the will, we were trying to make sure, I said, hey, give us some grace because we got to see what works and what does not work. And uh, over time, we figured out trying to have one a month and then trying to do the online components. Once we get that back rolling, that's, that's not just us, that's the church, a component that has to be worked out together. Uh, once that goes back, that should happen back in January. Going forward in January, we'll start those again. But what I was really most proud of was on our own, we've been able to galvanize between four to 600 live people, and we just started these pages. Like, they just started within like nine months. So I, I really want to, uh, I'm excited about that. So live between 400 to 600, we've had over 120,000 people watch between Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. That's amazing to me, okay? That's amazing to me. Down at the bottom, I'll, I'll, talk, to this, I'll talk to you about this at the end. We've been generated between three to $5,000 a service. Now, that would sound good if it was Destiny World and, and Firehouse, but you guys have jobs and you guys uh, have careers. 
this we need to do better and we'll talk about why because when you equate this to this it doesn't match that means we're just watching and clapping our hands and not supporting and there's nowhere in the world where you get a room like this for absolutely free with musicians for absolutely free and sound and camera absolutely free it would come out of your budget so this is an area where we got to show bishop that we appreciate it more we've done we've done very very well here and I think this is going to, I'm not going to just use the word triple, but I think at least double because we didn't have any advertisement from our advertisement team on, at the, in the church. But we will next year because we know when we're doing it. We have a good plan based off of the trial and error from this year. From here, followers on social media, we've got over 22,000 people that have followed us in a short amount of time. I think that's incredible. Amen. <laughs> Our reach is at 377,000 plus. I think that's amazing, all right? And our page profile visit, we've had over 71,000 people take a look at us, over 200 posts, and we just started the Will Text subscribers, and there's 1,000 or 1,200 people that's already on that. So you're touching people, and I wanted you to see this, so because sometimes when you're sitting in a room and there's not people here, you don't realize that they are watching and that they're being touched. Uh, one thing that's not on here is we have gear that has that's in i think 39 states all right so there's will clothing that's been sent out to almost all 52 states i think that's amazing too come on uh when it comes to serving we've had 929 people actually sign up to volunteer now we've got to do a better job between this number and this number active there's 120 people on file that are rotated between those sunday morning serves when we've had the opportunity to serve on sunday mornings with five opportunities and then we've had eight volunteer opportunities that have to do with United Mega Care and then with the Will College team as well. And that's going to pick up going into 2023. And on the invite culture, there's 129 in uh, total email sends that's going out. The open rate is 59%, which is 16% higher than the average, which I think is doing very, very well. Our, quick, our click rate is at 5%, which is 2% compared to the industry average. And here we've got 900 plus subscribers and we've only had 63 people out of all the people that have unsubscribed for what we're doing here so give yourself a hand I think that's incredible <laughs> from January to November we tried to estimate that hey this first year we ought to be able to raise at least eighty three thousand dollars we hit forty six thousand up until this point which I think is pretty good for having us on and off, on and off, on and off, not understanding when. But this number is not good for us. This number is a good number for just somebody just starting off. We are employed people. Somebody say, we're employed people. We're employed people. So what we want to do this year is make sure that when we give, that we give knowing that this is not separate from the potter's house. This is the potter's house. All right? And if it's not for the potter's house, we don't have the will. And so when Bishop pulls all of this information i want him to pull this information saying wow you guys are making a great impact okay in all categories what he told me on the phone was thank you so much for the impact you guys have done a phenomenal job let's do better here because we're not kids that's what he said we're not somebody said we're not kids so we want to do better here tonight I'm expecting us to take this above fifty thousand dollars because this is where we are as of no uh what is this november December. So November is when this came out. December is the last month of this year. So we should be able to take this number well over $50,000. Somebody say amen. amen. Those of you that are online, I want everybody tonight, everybody tonight, we're going to give $5,000. is nothing for a room like this. That's simple. All right. So everybody in this room, I want you to sow something, whatever God has put in your heart, and you should have already graduated from the dollar. All right. We have already graduated from sewing a dollar. I want everybody in this room, if you can, because we experimented this year. If, it, if you're able to sew a hundred dollars a night, I want you to do that. And if you can do more, I want you to do that. But if you can't, you don't complain. I want you to give your best absolute gift that you can give. And I want this number to go over 50,000. So when he looks at this, he feels good about everything that we're doing because we are doing a great job in spite of everything that happened starting this year with inconsistencies trying to figure out what to do. But ending this year, I think that we're in a great position. We have an understanding now of what we're up against and what we can do. And uh, we've got a calendar together. We listen to you and we put your ideas in the calendar. So your voice has been heard and the 2023 year has been strategized 
based off of everything that we discuss. So I'm excited about going into it, but this number is something we've got to do better because of all the things that you said you want to do. They don't do them for free. Amen? So how many going to give tonight? Clap your hands if you're going to give tonight. What I want you to do is I want you to do that right now. Everybody, we're going to get ready to give. I want you to get your devices in your hand if you're going to give by text to give. It is, well, what's the wheel text number? Is it 28950, the wheel? 28950, it's right in front of you. Text to give wheel to 28950. If you're going to give old-fashioned, it's very, very easy. There's a bucket right in front of the stage, and you can get your cash, your check, and you can write and you can support the ministry the best way you know how. But everybody tonight, if you can sacrifice $100, I want you to do that. Those of you that are online, and $100 is nothing to you, I want you to double that and so $200. God has blessed you in order to be able to give. And I don't, I'm not going to act as if everybody gave this morning because sometimes you didn't and some didn't even come this morning. Uh, one of my concerns was I said to Bishop, I said, I'm scared of double taxing them. He said, everybody didn't go to church this morning. Trust me. And everybody didn't give this morning. Trust me. He said, so ask them to sow. This is a wonderful church. What we do, we do it all around the world. And so you know you're sowing into good ground. So today I want you to sow, knowing that you're sowing into the potter's house, into the greatest leader of all time that has ever been born in this earth that is allowing us to meet and gather in settings like this. So everyone get your seed. Once you get your seed and you've purposed in your heart what you're going to give and you're doing it on your cellular device, I want you to stand on your feet. If you need an envelope, wave your hand and they'll bring it to you. There's one hand to my left. Everybody should be giving something. Everybody should be giving something. I don't care if it's five dollars. When we planted our church in Oklahoma, I used to tell them, you can't even go to the movies for free. You can't take a date to the movies for less than $25. Milk duds cost $3.99. The ice, it costs $6.50. The popcorn, the small, is $5. Is it nine? Yeah, every time I go, it's $80. I don't even, because I'm one of them ones, I don't care if I get through eating fried chicken, dressing, soda, I got to have the popcorn. I got to have it regardless. So it's $80 for me every time. All right? Don't give God less than what you give the movies. If you don't have anything, give him movie money tonight. Once you get your seed, whether you're giving it by card, phone, get that seed in your hand. If you don't have anything, stand with us anyway. Lift that seed up and say, Father, thank you for the opportunity to sow into the kingdom. I thank you. I believe your word. As of right now, the seed that I sow, it is going to bless my family. It's going to bless my church. I thank you now for you have given seed to the sower. And I am a sower in Jesus' name. If you believe it, come on and praise him like you love him. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You may be seated. All right, real quickly, I want each person to just introduce yourself. Just tell them who you are real fast, and we're going to get moving because i got to get Dr. Natasha out of here, okay? And we'll start with Dr. Natasha. Tell them who you are because some don't know. Hi, this is my home. This has been my home for the last almost 17 years. So I am Dr. Natasha Gresham. I am the director of the Center for Counseling and Behavioral Health here at the Potter's House. All right. I am Dr. Brittany Torrance. Tell them where you work at. Tell them it's okay. okay. Yeah, I work for Dallas County Juvenile Department. I am a clinician for um, Dallas County Juvenile Department. I work at Lee Todd Residential Treatment Facility, 13 to 17 year old girls. Thank you so much. And I am Jay Barnett, uh, soon to be Dr. Jay Barnett in August. Yes, sir. So, yeah. <laughs> We're going to jump right, 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 right in. I've got questions. I've got almost 40 questions. There's no way where I can cover all of them, but I'm going to jump right out here with some that I know that will go straight to Dr. Natasha, and then you guys can tag team. I struggle with the feeling 
of dreading coming back home with a toxic relative. I'm trying to do better, to watch the environment I put myself in, to escape my home with relatives. What advice would you give for this? Wow, and this is so relevant just because of the holiday season. We tend to go back home and you may have changed, but your environment or your relatives may have not changed. Know that you're going back for a brief moment. You're, you're going to visit, not live. So you can tolerate anything for a couple of hours and don't let people bait you into the old you. You the new you, right? And um, can I say something? Listen, uh, I went to go see Michelle Obama the other night. She was speaking, and she said something that resonate, resonated with me. She said, the way you live your life is your reply. Wow. Live your life in front of that toxic person and tell them, you don't have to be bitter. I can walk in grace. I can walk in forgiveness. I do not have to let, it's not the water that's outside the boat that sinks it. It's the water that gets inside the boat. Don't let dirty water on your boat. Okay. Anybody else want to tag to that? Just to piggyback off of what Dr. Natasha said, that something practical that you could do is have someone there that you would consider a support system so that if you if you get triggered, if you feel overwhelmed, that you can kind of tag team that person in to support you if you need to take a break or take a step out so that you can have a safe space within that space. Because it can get overwhelming when you're in the space wherever you get triggered or get overwhelmed, you can take a, a break away and find someone, whether it's a, another relative who you see as a support system or someone that you trust. Thank you so much. After being freed from addictions, and brought back to a place of strength. How do you know where to be vulnerable with your gifts and who are you and who you are after being abused and misunderstood? You want me to reword it, reread re it, or are we good? Re yes, okay. Please. After <laughs> after being freed from addictions and brought back to a place of strength, how do you know where to be vulnerable with your gifts and who you are? after being abused and misunderstood? Anyone? It, it sounds like this person is still in the place of healing, still discovering who you are, and so you have to be very careful. And this is the thing, I, I say this all the time, you can't have blind trust. Everybody's not worthy of you, and everybody doesn't know how to handle you. There's my daughter. I told her a long time ago, I said, everybody likes a diamond, but everybody can't afford it. Okay? You're a diamond. Just, just because they like you and admire you doesn't mean they can afford you. Okay, so if you're in a place of healing, you can't be exposed to everybody in every situation. So if you're still kind of second guessing, I say get a therapist. Okay, get somebody that can hold you accountable, that can help you figure out where do I be vulnerable? How do I be vulnerable? What does that look like? And how do I distinguish between manipulation and abuse and genuine encouragement, support, and all those things? Because coming out of addiction, there still might be some haze. There still might be some uh, blurred lines there. So get with a, can I say this, professional? Yes. Professional counselor. I want to okay. segue right there because that's the next question. How does a person who has been through critical trauma, a severe automobile accident, childhood suppression, find a good therapist? How? I get this question all the time and y'all Google everything else. <laughs> it is not that hard. I am coming against this stereotype and this myth that it's hard to find a good counselor. It is not hard, it just takes work. It's not gonna drop in your lap like anything else, okay? So as a counselor, as a director of a counseling center with eight good counselors, uh, it is not hard. We want people to spoon feed us sometime, and I don't wanna come off, y'all know me, you know I love you, but I'm, I'm real, right? It is not hard, just like you find a mechanic. Your car breaks down, you ain't, well, I'm just gonna catch the bus, cause you know what, the car's broke. No, you find, you ask somebody, you Google, okay? So same thing, same principle. And especially in this age group, y'all are open to therapy. You guys go, stop letting it be a secret. 
tell somebody, oh, I know a good therapist, let that be okay, okay? Yeah. Just like you exchange, girl, where'd you get your hair done? Where'd you get your nails done? Look, she got me all the way together up here, okay? He did his work on me, okay? So it is not hard, okay? And this is the other thing. Just like if you go to a doctor or a dentist or a mechanic and you don't have the best experience, what? You change, you get a new one, same thing. Thing. So let's let's dispel this myth that it's hard to find a good therapist. It is not. Okay, and if you confess that, then it will be. Say, I'm walking into the new year with the new attitude, and I'm gonna get me a new therapist if I need one. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And there's a lot of sites out there that are accredited sites, sites that are reputable, that you can find a therapist, you can read their bios, and actually call them and they offer consultations for 10, 15 minutes so that you can see if it's a good fit for you. And we also see if it's a good fit for us too, so that we can, can we help you at this moment where you are? Do we have the specialties that you need so that we can provide services to you? So like she said, it's not hard, it just takes work. And I always tell my friends, you know, I recommend my therapist or another therapist, or I know a friend of a friend. So having someone who is in therapy and who is actively saying like, I go to therapy and it's open about it, it makes it a lot easier. Thank you. So I was gonna add, um, it's a relationship, right? When you think about therapy, uh, it's a relationship with the individual. Um, what we do beyond our scope, our heuristics and our education, it's also understanding what does a client need. And I challenge everyone when you're going to, uh, to a therapist, uh, ask questions like you do when you're on a date. Right, you have to date the therapist because for us, even though we are gifted in our clinical uh, skills, but there's still things that we don't know about you. Uh, it's important to have someone who's culturally competent. And let me say this, not every black therapist will help a black person. Okay, let me just say that. We're not a monolith, so we don't have all this, we don't share the same experiences. So we may all share the same colors, skin color, but we don't share the same experiences. And so when you are um, going through this uh, therapeutic journey and looking for a therapist, it's okay to ask questions. Have you worked with someone um, that has experienced racial trauma? Have you worked with someone who's dealt with molestation, abuse? Have you dealt with someone who, or should I say work with someone who has experienced these traumatic things that I've experienced? Because you would be surprised of the clinicians that are not competent in the areas that you would think. So when you're looking at bios, someone may have a expertise in depression, but they may struggle uh, to work with someone who's uh, in a workplace that is toxic. Right, and so it's important to ask questions and don't be afraid to ask the therapist questions. Like I've had people ask me, have you worked with couples? What is your success rate? These are good questions. It's like when you're on a date, right? I mean, if you're on a date, the, part, the, 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 the purpose of the date is, is to collect some data, right? Ask some questions, you know? So it's, it's no different. And so when you're going through this process, be patient with yourself. Uh, it took me years before I became a clinician. When I was in therapy, I, I went to two therapists. I had a white guy and I had a black guy. The white guy was a, a, a practical guy. He was a cognitive behavior therapist. And the brother was a spiritual counselor. So I went to both of them. And the brother came into the session with a suit on. And I knew then, I said, I can't do it, good brother. <laughs> I grew up in the church. My dad's a pastor. so. When we, he started talking, and I brought up, he says, what are you dealing with? I said, I'm dealing with some unforgiveness. I got some dad issues. And the brother brought out the Bible. And I could tell you right now, man, it was the biggest turnoff ever, Dr. Stewart. I mean, it was the biggest turnoff because I'm sitting there and said, brother, I know scripture. <laughs> but this issue has got me depressed. I can't get out of bed. And so I, that was the last session <laughs> that I had with that guy. Nothing wrong with him, but I knew that wasn't what I needed. I needed practical tools and steps uh, on how to implement, you know, how do I work through this unforgiveness that is causing my life to be in this downward spiral, this trauma loop that I was constantly in. And in that process, uh, the white guy uh, was 
giving me steps, and he gave me this assignment. He says, I want you to write about your dad. I said, oh, I can't do that. And he said, this is where we're going to start. So, uh, and, I, and I'm just sharing this because sometimes we feel, you know, especially in today's society, what works for someone else may not work for you, and that's okay. You know, you have so many different types of therapists that uh, can, can support you and, and help you foster in that space. Let me, let me jump, let me jump. You can clap. How do you feel it's best to combat the feelings of failure concerning dating, relationships, when everyone around you seems to be happy in relationships, engaged, married, without staying focused on yourself? That's the question. Get off social media? <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> you want me to read it again? No, what did you say? He said get off social get media. Get off social media? <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Absolutely. Tell, everybody ain't happy. Though. Everybody ain't happy. There's this illusion. Yes. There's such an illusion with social media and with filters, and everybody is just running through the tulips and just in love. And in reality, they're across the room from each other, not speaking to each other. Okay? So don't judge your life by somebody's highlights. Okay? Please don't. Please don't. I'm going to keep going, okay? I'm okay. going to keep going because okay. I want to I get as much as I can out of okay. you before you got to get on that plane. I have relationship issues with men. How do I move past that? Any, any, any one of you three. You need to get in counseling because you're, 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 the answer's not going to be solved in this, this setting. It's not. And I, and, and I can give you something, but it's not going to take hold because really when you ask that question, you want a quick fix. He said he went through two therapists, and he was in therapy for years, right? Some stuff the Lord does instantaneously, okay, and delivers you. Other stuff, it's a journey you got to walk through, okay? And you have to be willing to change because if every man that you meet is a problem, now you're the common denominator. So just because somebody injured you doesn't mean everybody that looks like them is going to injure you. So if you're meeting men that just keep injuring you, I have to say, now what? Do you have kibbles and bits in your pocket? Like, what, what's going on? Because you're attracting dogs. So I, can, can I be honest? So get in therapy. Get in therapy, and you have to take responsibility. We, we come from this culture that we like to be the victim. I say, whoever's telling this story, you either going to be the victim or the hero. Stop playing the victim card. And it's true, you may have been abused. Somebody may have done you wrong, OK? But now you're looking through the lens of your wound. So now everything that comes across, can I be so transparent? This is my husband. Some of y'all know him as white chocolate. But this is my husband. And I, cause I don't want to sit up on this stage and act like my life is so perfect, but it kind of is. But, um, <laughs> but Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving day, we had family, we had a great time, but I noticed he was just a little bit short with me, right? And I was like, okay, what did happen? And he heard something through the lens. Somebody called me Stuart. He's like, your name is Gresham. Why are people calling you Stuart? It's been a year. They should know your name is Gresham. But he heard it through the lens of something else. And once we discussed it, he realized, okay, that's not, that's not even in your control. I said, I done put you on a national stage and called you out and said, you the love of my life. I'm married to you. My name is Gresham. But old triggers, old triggers. So you have to be careful. And when you're in a relationship, relationships takes grown people. Wow. You, can, can I say that? Wow, wow, wow. If you're in a relationship, it takes grown people. And then he had to tell me, well, you're tone with me. And I had to own, okay, baby, I'm sorry people were here. I was trying to do something. I was a little snappy with you. But we had to talk. As wonderful as our life is, as many trips as he takes me on, uh, you know, as good as our life is, we still have to work. And we still have to communicate. And if I hurt his feelings, I have to say sorry, even when I didn't say Stuart. But I still said, baby, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get this fixed, right? 
Or when he said my tone, yes. Or when I said maybe you're hearing through your lens and he said you're right, okay, I understand. It's a process. Mm -hmm. So we had to compromise but we had to talk about it. You can't hold on to stuff so everybody you see now is an issue. Wow. That's a wound. What I and think is so interesting I'm to you. Sorry. No, 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 you're good. I'm just trying to get all I can oh, out of I'm you. Sorry. The, uh, you I me. called her to come do this, and I said, Thank you, Dr. So, uh, Dr. Gresham. <laughs> I said, Yes, ma'am, Dr. Gresham. So I just wanted to just come right behind that to tell you she's serious about it. It's not just a stage presentation. Absolutely. In, the, in a casual conversation that happened. I'm going to keep moving. All right, I'm going to keep moving. So, y'all got plenty to talk about. Uh, when you cut someone out of your life, how can you move on without feeling the emotional pain of moving on? I think that's natural. Like that emotional part is the natural part. That's normal. And I think knowing that is the best part of it that you need to know. Because once you get, because when we're in that moment of emotional pain, it's like, oh, did I make the wrong decision? Maybe I should go back. No, you should keep moving. And then knowing that after time passes, it will get better. And so knowing that a part of that breakup or heartbreak is normal, is natural, that you will go through that portion of it. And then once you get on the other side, that things will get better. And like Dr. Natasha mentioned, like continue to go to therapy so that you can work on you and work on the things that that closed door that Pastor Ari mentioned this morning that you need to address is there and it's not going anywhere. And so until you address it, you need to make sure that you open that door. And it's called grief. Right, it's a lot. Grief, yeah. it's the end of something. I, I, I think one of the things that, that I see with a lot of individuals that come in is nobody wants to sit in anything. Mm -mm. Everybody wants to find a quick way to move on because many of our relationships have become transactional and, and we don't have true connection. And so let's say that you do have a connection with someone that has lost a connection with you, they become dis disconnected, yeah. and you cut that person out of your life for a healthy reason. You will still mourn the loss of that relationship because it was a familiar space as we're taking. It was something that you routinely had going on. It's just like when people go through divorce. I've, I've heard some people say it feels like a death. Yeah. Because it's the end of something. If you lose your job after you've been there for five years, it's going to be a grieving process. It's going to be a death, which is just the end of something. So I would say as it is the end of something, allow yourself to feel that emotion. Don't rush it. Mourn. Mourn. It's okay to mourn. It says, man, this hurt. Doesn't mean that you're sitting still. What it does is it, 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 it's, um, it is a reflection of your humanity that you feel. You know, I think the worst thing to do when, when, when we lose loved ones is to tell them to be strong. Yeah. Man, let me fall apart. I'm a human. Mm -hmm. So if you need to fall apart from cutting that person out for whatever reason, it's okay. Allow that process to run its course. I want to ask, how do you know when God is telling you to leave a job? If, if any one of y'all can. I, here's the thing, though. Is it, I, my, my question is, why does it have to be God telling you to leave the job? Are you happy with the job? I, I think we, so here's what I believe, Pastor Joel. It's easy. <laughs> it's easy to put it on God because we don't have to make a decision. God honors your choice. If you don't want to be there, it's okay to do something different and leave and not wait for God to tell you. Yeah. That, anybody, you got, that's good, thank you. And they use therapy the same way. Coming to therapy is not for us to tell you what to do. Because you'll leave here and say, oh, I want to get in counseling, and then you ask me what to do. It's God's job to tell you what to do. It's your courage to hear and move on. And once again, there's some just life things that we're able to choose. Yes. And if a job is not making you happy, you don't have to wait on a sign in the parting of the Red Sea. Right? Okay. Right. 
So I, I think it's that fear. You want somebody to blame. People come in all the time and say, well, do you think I should divorce? Well, do you think you should divorce? <laughs> you know, you're not putting that on me, you know? Yes, take responsibilities. Once again, take an accountability and don't be scared. If you make the wrong decision, if you leave the right way, you can go back. That's the truth. That's the truth. I, I, I could keep going right there. We're going to keep going. Let's see. Uh, as I left, I left, I left the church and a job. Okay? I left both, and both were in great shape when I left. Okay? I left because my Bible tells me I'm blessed going in and coming out. Well, come on. The blessing is on me, not on the place. So I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. So when I came here, it was a risk because I wanted to, I wanted more in another area. And I had an opportunity to get more in that area from who I believe is the greatest person in the world to teach me how to do it. So I walked away right. I walked away right. So as, as, just as you just said, I can go back today if I want to because I left right. All right, and God didn't tell me nothing. Me and God talked about it. God said, let me tell y'all something real quick. <clears throat> You're not going to hear an answer that's different from the word of God. So if you don't read the word of God, then you're not going to be able to process what God tells you to do anyway. Because <laughs> if God tells you to do something that's super strange, you're going to think it's not God. But if you haven't read the word and seen all the strange things God asks people to do, it's never going to make sense to you, but it will always make faith. Okay, it won't make sense, but it will make faith. And so you, you're not going to get an answer that doesn't run in line with the word of God. You'll be able to trace it in the word of God. It may not be the exact same circumstance, but you will see how God flows and how God moves. And what the word does, when the Bible talks about being uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind, the Bible talks about being not conformed to this world. So the word of God takes you from this confirmation that you have to deal with the pattern of how the world does things. And the world's got some good systems. It's got some good systems, okay? So, but what, what the Word of God does, it allows you to discern between the systems, okay? It allows you to see what God is saying. And you don't always have to hear an audible voice, go left and turn and I'll be there. <laughs> because you've read the Word and you hear the Word, you kind of know how God flows with you. And you don't have to always call and ask somebody, what is God saying about me to you? When you can just read the word and spend time, consecrated time with God and learn how God talks to you. Does that make sense? All right. What is discernment? That's a question. What is discernment? Pastor? <laughs> I discern in my spirit. That one's for you. Discernment comes from a word... Uh, 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 it comes from a word in the Greek that means divide, okay? That word divide means simply that I'm able to separate without being judgmental, okay? So that I can actually see God and see what God is saying because it looks like God's characteristics and I'm able to discern. Uh, I believe there's a scripture uh, that talks about the word of God being able to pierce the marrow and the bone and you can see the discernment. It's the word of God that is the one thing that can separate the soul and the spirit. It's the only thing that knows the difference, that one thing. So the word of God heightens your discernment, your prayer life heightens your discernment. You will never be able to, to discern if you don't consecrate. Does that make sense? Yes. You're not going to be able to see what God is saying if you don't ever read what God is saying and if you don't ever listen to what God is saying in the word of God. So you're asking God to give you something that you won't even spend time processing with God. Okay? Discernment is simple. That I'm learning how to spiritually see what God is saying without being judgmental. It divides the carnality between the spirituality. Does that make sense? Can I say something? Yes, ma'am. Pastor, I agree with what he's saying, but I also want to say the best teacher of discernment is experience. That's right. That's right. You, you, you experience, your discernment really kicks up. That's right. <laughs> okay. That's right. I, I'm homeless because I didn't pay my rent on time. Guess what? My discernment says pay your rent. Come on here. <laughs> I'm serious. Experience. Some of us keep going through the same, we wandering in the wilderness. And we're saying, well, I'm just waiting on discernment. You passed this rock three times. When you going to get a sense of direction? This is not the right way. 
experience and common sense. We put these spiritual terms because we want to get spiritual and spooky and deep. Come on. What is discernment? What, what's your real question? Which way to go? That's what you asked. They've made some bad decisions. They, they exactly. And you let's not be deep. Let's not be spiritual. Experience. What did you learn from your last decision? What did you learn from your last heartbreak? What did you learn from your last bad whatever? What did you learn? What did you take accountability for? That's discernment. Come on here. Watch this. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I think it's verse 14 and 15. It says, that's why only someone who has God's spirit can understand spiritual blessings. Anyone who doesn't have God's spirit thinks that the blessings are foolish. People who are guided by the spirit can make all kinds of judgments, but they cannot be judged by others. The scriptures ask, how has everyone ever known the thoughts of the Lord are giving him advice, but we understand what Christ is thinking. That's Bible. All right. The spirit of God, your relationship with God will help you do God things. If you don't have one, don't expect to do God things. Mm. It's that simple. All right. Let's go to another question. I got how many minutes you got Four. Eight, Eight minutes. minutes. In the Jewish and Indian communities, there are matchmakers to help singles find other singles to build marriages within the same faith. Why do we leave matchmaking up to the world, society for us, and where are our Christian matchmakers? Oh, Jesus. Come on, Dr. Gresham. I know you got a word for that question. It's a quick punch. You deserve, you deserve. You deserve. I deserve it. Listen, listen. But look, we're laughing, but shuddy show that arranged marriages in other cultures last longer. Because it's not just he looks good, she look good, she at 32, 36, 32, right? They core values. This, this is, I just did this course, um, if you want a Boaz, and I talk about we stop at chemistry. Because we, we, oh, he's fine, oh, he works out, he's this, he's that, she's this, she's that, all the visual stuff. And that's important, chemistry is important, but then we don't know about compatibility. Because chemistry will get you in the room, but compatibility will make you want to stay in the room. So we, we, we have to go past chemistry, then we have to get to, are we compatible? Do we have the same interests, the same goals, the, the same things that are gonna keep us together? That's compatibility. And see, when we talk about arranged marriage in other uh, cultures and countries, that's what the family's looking at. How can your family bless our family? How can our family bless your family? What are our common goals and our common interests? Doesn't matter she cute, don't matter if he cute. It, th that goes out the window. I hope he cute, you know, because we're, we're talking about compatibility and we're talking about creative conflict because there is going to be conflict when you join families together. But how do you overcome those? You can be creative in overcoming conflict. So I get the question. We kind of giggled. But, honey, I got a daughter right now and I, I, I'm trying to match make myself so you can help me. You know, I'm, I'm you know, she's 28. No, she, how old are you? 26. Law, lawyer. Good, good credit. Good family. Hit me up. Um, so I'm trying to match make. I'm trying to match make myself, okay? Be because and one because I know where she comes from and I know her potential and I know where she's going. So I get that. I I, I believe in matchmaking. If she would just let me, she don't trust me though. So <laughs> I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move because I, I I need you. To, I need you as much as I can for you go. Sorry, no, no, you kill it. Distracted. You kill it, and I love it. Is there such a thing as oversharing? On a first date, if so, uh, okay. Now, now, shh, now, this is one thing I want y'all to re realize. This is someone's actual question. It's not something that I just pulled out of a hat. Somebody's in this room that asked this question, or they're online. Okay. Can, can I say this? There was a good guy and a good girl. They both were good, but he overshared on the first date and it scared her. 
because she, he didn't know that was her trauma. She, she wanted somebody, she was in fairy tale thinking that wanting somebody who never got divorced. And on the first date, he gave the whole history of his, because he thought, I'm being open. I'm going to put all my cards on the table. And you want to go open, but you can't give it all on the first date. OK? So you have to have boundaries. And once again, I heard this. Boundaries are not walls, they're limits. There's limits to what you share on the first date. Everybody shouldn't walk away with all your stuff. Because they may not be the person to hold your stuff. So yes, yeah, so you, you want to be open, but you want to be guarded. So you take it slow. We, we're not in a marathon. Uh, we're not in a sprint. It's more of a marathon. And how do you know this person is trustworthy? Go back and listen to Sarah's message about character. Where is this person's character? Can I trust you with my stuff? If you don't have the answer to that, then don't overshare. Don't overshare. And it's not being secretive, it's being selective. OK, there's a difference. And I was just going to add, too, there's a huge difference between sharing and disclosing. Sh sharing is when you are transparent. You're open. Disclosing is when you guys have reached a level of vulnerability. And as I like to say, I'm always transparent, but I'm selective in where I'm vulnerable at. And so when you are vulnerable, you have discern, here's that word again, discern, that is safe. And let me tell you something. If somebody tells you it's a safe place, it's not. It's a safe place. Be open. No, it's not. I tell you, it, it's going to be damaging. Safe doesn't tell you it's safe. You discern that it's safe. You feel safe. You feel home. And that's, and that's a process. And that takes steps. And that takes time. And as we are all in this space now, right, uh, as I say, talking about mental health has become a, uh, ubiquitous because everybody's talking about it. So everybody's open. But here's the thing. Understand that there's a difference in when you share Meaning like, yeah, I've been married and been divorced, but the vulnerable part or do you disclosing is you're talking about what happened or what caused the divorce. Do y'all understand that difference? That's just practical. That way you're not, as, as Dr. Gresham said, you're just not out here throwing everything on the table and folks out here, shell, you know, they shock like, you know, great guy, but I don't know if I don't want a second date. And, and again, we, we, we live in a world where it's just, you, you, I like to say you got to drip people. You know, you see this a lot in marketing, is they just kind of give you a little bit here and, and the closer it gets, you know, when there's an event, it just gives you a, 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 a flyer, hey, this is coming. And the closer it gets, you know, they start feeding you more. So, and the closer you get to that person and the closer you guys uh, begin to spend more time, you become more open because now you're developing a space of trust. How not to beat yourself up with guilt after succumbing to the temptation of watching porn, I will get the urge, then I'll ignore it. I will finally watch it a few minutes, turn it off, then feel guilty. Once again, counseling. Getting in counseling and having accountability and understanding why. If you, if you went some time without it, what was the trigger to make you go back to it? And so it's not feeling guilty about it, it's understanding this is a struggle. Paul said, I have this thorn, okay? And so you may always feel the urge, doesn't mean you have to follow through on it, okay? And you have to, guilt just says there's something wrong, but don't wallow in guilt, okay? Dust yourself off and start again and get, build in some parameters for yourself. Build in some accountability for yourself. Get into counseling. Counseling helps. Counseling works if you work it, okay? So once again, for anything, for any addiction, for any addiction, whether it's pornography, drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever that addiction is, it's called addiction for a reason, okay? And you need help, and you do not have to do it alone. You do not have to do it alone. And there's no shame when you get in the counseling session. There's no shame. I don't care what people come and tell me. There's no shame. I want to help you break the cycle, but you need help because what you're doing is not working. You're just on that wheel like that hamster. So reach out to somebody who can help you. 
And understanding what your seemingly irrelevant decisions are, if I am an alcoholic and I am invited to a happy hour, if I put myself in certain situations that, are, um, that make me vulnerable to relapse, then I need to make sure what are my boundaries I need to set, what are some of my seemingly irrelevant decisions that I think are small, like, oh, it's just our birthday, I'll go and visit, but then now I'm in a space where I'm vulnerable to, to relapse. I got one last question and Dr. Natasha's got to go. After finding myself in a situation ship where I was the other woman, being, hold on y'all, come on, being emotionally, mentally, and verbally abused, and after finally getting out and doing the work to heal from my past and heal myself and love myself, how can I properly date without thinking karma will come back and be knocking at my door? or if I have repented and forgiven, been forgiven, is that something a Christian shouldn't worry about? It's a great question. All of them are. You're still feeling guilty. God has forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. Because there are things I've done that I know ain't coming back, <laughs> okay? That's under the blood. You have to forgive yourself. And this is the thing, once again, counseling, getting into counseling and understand why you allowed yourself to be the other woman. And also, what, who was it that you picked to be the other woman with? What attracted you to that? What were his characteristics like? So you don't attract that again. And once again, ask good questions good questions to make sure you're not ending up in that situation again. And if you, if they are not single, if they, are, they don't have divorce papers, they married. Don't fall for the okie doke. We going through something. We separated right now. It's a process. Anybody who wants to be divorced can be divorced. Okay? So don't fall for the okie doke. And don't beat yourself up. You made a mistake and it does not have to come back to haunt you or anything like that. You can make healthy choices and don't feel guilty. Karma is not Christianity. Karma is not fate and destiny. Karma is simply law of consequence. That I make a decision and I suffer the consequence of that decision. It's either a benefit or it's a suffering. It's not Christianity. So don't think that you're looking at something like that. And Christianity isn't like that either. She just told you it's under the blood, all right? So for that person that answered that question, I hope that you got an answer. I want you to thank God for Dr. Gresham. <laughs> I got a few more questions that we're going to ask that we're going to turn you all to lose. Just a couple of more for our guests that are still here. When a woman is attracted to a man, how should she approach the man? Also, some do's and don'ts. But we got to... When a woman is attracted to a man, how should she approach the man? It's about someone's Jade. Oh, gosh. That's a really good question. I don't know when did this become so technical, right? I mean, it's... Like, I really got to feel my heartbeat on this because I want to make sure I land right and land properly. I don't think there's anything, so, so you, you hear this language, right? Uh, should a woman uh, pursue a man? If you, when you talk about pursuing, that's a different thing, right? I think that word has a different terminology from approach, right? If you're in pursuit of something, that's usually a, a, a strategy or there's intentionality behind it. But I don't think there's anything wrong with approaching someone uh, with sharing uh, that you are attracted to them or there's interest there. Where we go wrong is if I share that I am interested, but the individual is not interested in me. I think that's where the problem lies. I don't think there's do's or don't. I don't think there's a problem with sliding somebody's DM and says, hey, I'm you know, I'm peeping, checking, whatever you, you know, pull up or shoot your shot. What is that what they call it now? Shoot your shot. 
So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think the, the don't is understanding that uh, you, you don't have to present yourself in a way where it looks desperate. But I don't think there's anything wrong with presenting yourself and sharing that you are interest. That's a, that's a tough one, man. Yeah, because I think the, the difference of approaching and pursuing, like if I'm cha like pursuing someone, it's different than just, hey, introducing myself and letting you know that I'm interested. I think, I don't know if everyone would think it's a personal preference of, or a characteristic or what your idea would be, but, or what, I would want to know, like, what would, what's your intention? in approaching, like what is the intention behind it? Am I trying to manipulate a situation to get a need met? Or but what is the reason why I'm, I'm approaching or pursuing? Well, I think it's, 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 it's challenging today because dating has changed. Right. You know, the dating world has shifted. You know, uh, these streets is, is rough out here. You know, like, like let's, let's keep it all the way 100, man. These streets is ruthless. And so you, you kind of, so I, I'll, I'll be even transparent. Like, I've shot my shot before, and I miss. And the way I did it was I, I told the young lady, hey, I put myself out there. I'm interested. And she was like, oh, I'm flattered. And it was just in a way where it was very, you know, soft. I wasn't overly aggressive, you know, like, hey, what's up? Just like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in you. And she was like, oh, I'm flattered, but I'm, I'm, I'm in a season where I'm not dating. I said, oh, okay. Well, I just backed off. And, and, and I think where we are today is so many individuals are deal that, that have challenges with rejection. So there's a fear of how to approach. And the fear is really if I approach and it's not embrace. So let me say, if you shoot your shot, male or female, this is a 50-50 chance somebody may be interested and somebody may not be interested. Somebody may be on what you own. Or not. Or not. And you and can make a choice. And it's okay. Yeah. And I think we have to get to a place to honoring somebody's choice or decision and just leave it there, you know? But the young lady did spin the block, right? And says, hey, I'm back dating. I said, oh, God. <laughs> Hey, King, I wasn't interested in. <laughs> you ain't gonna spin the block on me. <laughs> so, so, once, so then if I am interested again, now my show, it's over? I, I wouldn't say it's over, but I probably have, have moved on. <laughs> you know? Like, for real, like, I'm not going like to the next question. No, no, not, no, it's, 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 I'm, it's I'm not. I'm going to the next question. Pride. I'm going to the next question. I'm, 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 I'm being serious. How do yeah. you deal with conflict if you've never been around it to know how to resolve it in a relationship? How do you deal with conflict if you've never been around it to know how to resolve it in a relationship? Therapy is a great place to start. And that, I know that's kind of like the ongoing quick answer, but learning practical ways and steps in how to resolve conflict, how to, how to deal with conflict, whether it's a platonic relationship, a family relationship, because conflict can, be, can get nasty with any relationship. And so if you, you need people, you know, we were created so that we can help each other and do the things that God has purposed us to do. We need relationships. And in order to do that, you need to learn how to handle and deal with conflict. And so conflict it's definitely a skill you can learn and practice in therapy. It's just interesting that they haven't seen conflict, just period. Or I wonder if it's they haven't seen it resolved in a healthy way. In a healthy way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. All right, let's see. How do you witness to a coworker when you haven't exactly been the best Christian in front of them? That's good. That's good. There, I'm let there, go first. There's no greater witness than how you live. Right, lifestyle. Lifestyle. Uh, and I, I think we grew up, I grew up in the Baptist church, and the witness was it's almost similar to Jehovah Witnesses. Mm -hmm. You know, let me tell you about Jesus. And I think the, the best way to tell someone about Jesus is how you live your life through Jesus and how you allow Jesus um, to live through you. And that becomes your witness and how you live your lifestyle becomes a door for conversation on what is it that 
that's keeping you in the midst of pe- I mean, in the midst of storms, trials, and tribulations, and especially in the workplace. How is how is it that you're so still? How is it that you're so balanced in your emotions? And that creates an opportunity to share who God is to you. Mm-hmm. And I think we live in a world where we do a lot of talking and not a lot of doing and, and just being. And I think the best way to really witness to anyone is through how you live your life. It's just like parenting. Kids care nothing about what you say, but how you live tells them everything. You can say it all day long, but they're watching how you live. So the world is watching how we live as believers. And how you live will show them how God is living through you mm-hmm. or how he is not living through you. That, that is one of the uh, easiest answers. That's a great answer. You shouldn't want to be witness in any way if you can't be inclusive in the conversation. Inclusive. I shouldn't be trying to tell you how to live if I ain't living worth a stank in front of you. Inclusive inclusive when you're a real witness you're sharing real struggles with the person and they see you as a human being not as a bible thumper and then there should be some accountability to your walk with God Uh, we've gotten to a place where we have no accountability we don't want to hear what any pastor has to say we just eat the word and we bounce but when it comes to actually applying what the scriptures actually say your response is you can't tell me what to do You can't tell me how to live. So there has to be some form of accountability and quit trying to tell other people what to do. Be inclusive in your witness. Tell your testimony. Share your real struggle. And then be inclusive with your lifestyle. They're going to be able to look at your lifestyle. They're not going to want to hear you anyway. So you're wasting your time trying to share about Jesus when you share about everything else. And you never mention him. You never mention him. So stop trying to witness what you've got to start trying to do is live right. Live right doesn't mean be perfect. Live right means live on purpose. All right, and I'm going to live on purpose, and they see something different in me than they see with other people. And then it makes them want to talk to you about God and not from a perfected place, from a place of purpose. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, this next question I want to get to, then I'm going to, I'm going to close it. There's two of them. My friend's wife won't sleep with him. Biblically, is it ever okay for him to take care of himself? And they're talking about masturbation. Okay. Um, Y'all want to jump in on that? (laughs) (laughs) Masturbation masturbation is a common human act that 70% of people do. The word masturbation you will never find in scripture. But what you'll find is lust of the flesh. And what you'll find is sexual immorality. So the question is, if you are masturbating, are you lusting after somebody that isn't your spouse? If you're lusting after somebody that isn't your spouse, then it's already sin because it's lust of the flesh and it becomes immoral sex, okay? Because your mind, even Jesus says in the New Testament, you've looked upon her and you've already sinned, all right? So the question is, do I have her on my mind as I please myself, okay? That becomes the issue. Nobody knows that but the person that's doing the masturbating, okay? That's number one. Um, If they're not, then you automatically know what that is. Uh, it is also, I said, sex, sexual immorality, self-gratification. Self-gratification is the opposite of self-control. Self-gratification, I lose myself. I just can't take it because these images are in my mind. I'm going to please myself immediately, okay? Uh, self-control is fruit of the spirit. That I can control myself, that I understand that this urge is here, but I have the ability to stand up in my anointing and block that as much as possible. Then you have the one verse that nobody likes to hear, but it's true. And if you cannot contain yourself, it's better to marry than it is to burn. Anybody know what that means? What does it mean? What does it mean? It's okay. Get married. (laughs) That's what it means. If you just on fire like that, 
and that's what you want, go on and get married so you don't have to worry about that. That's what that means. That's the simple answer to that question. It's a very common question, a very common answer, but if we don't make it common in church, then you'll get it. All right? It's a very, very common, very, What's very common question. What's the question about also his friend's wife isn't having She's not sex sleeping with him. with him. Yeah. Because I wonder if if they were willing to go to counseling together, it's a great if they were question. willing to, you know, be able to work that out. Because he's talking to his friend about it, but is he talking to his wife about it? That's a great question. Because great a question. lot of times that happens too, where we talk about our issues to other people, but not to the person. Great question. Great, great statement. Anything? Last one I'm going to get up, and this was a new one for me, with a couple of them. What are these new age things manifesting? Angel numbers, crystals. Zodiac signs, and how does a Christian respond to that? Uh, the angel numbers, from what I looked, up, looked at when I got the question, uh, the three-digit numbers that are reoccurring that are considered to be a number that gives you guidance. And if I keep seeing this number, this is the universe's way or the energy's way of telling me that this is the way to go. All right? Well, if you are a Christian, you already know the number is not your God. So you should be able to understand that automatically. All right? Uh, there is, numerology is a study. We know that there are certain numbers that mean certain things. But that's not what this is saying. What this is saying that these three-digit numbers that are in sequential order, I keep saying 111, I keep saying 666, or I keep saying 999, I keep saying 444. These become numbers that are speaking to me. The problem is somebody gave that number a meaning. So is that person that gave the number meaning God or is the number God? Those becomes, that becomes a point of discussion with that person. Now, I would never get into an argument with somebody about my faith. I think it's a waste of time. Uh, I know what I believe. If we're going to converse to argue, go somewhere else. But if this is a true conversation because you're thinking about becoming a believer, you want to become a Christian, then, of course, you're not going to go into that conversation without the word of God. And your response is always going to be about Jesus. And you'll be able to show how Jesus is Lord and Savior and how God sent him. Those are your responses to that. The new age stuff is this consciousness. This, this consciousness and how there's no specific God. It's all in your mind and you are God. Okay? That all of us are gods. That's what that stuff is. Now, all of us are made in the likeness and the image of God. Every last one of us. But, and we all have been given dominion in the earth, on the earth. That is Bible. That's how you respond to that. But none of us are the son of God, and none of us are God incarnate. None of us are God in the flesh. All right? That is our response. As far as the crystals are concerned, I don't know anything about the crystals, so I'll have to look at that so I can give you an answer if, if you're online or if you're in this room. Uh, I do not know anything about that, and I don't want to speak without having a true understanding of what that is. But the other two, that is my answer on that. Y'all got anything on that? I think one thing, I talked to my mentor about this a, a long time ago when I started hearing about people talk about crystals, and she said something extremely Simple and important that, you know, if we are in, made in the image of God and we want to be like Christ, what language did he use? If I'm using the language that he used, if I'm talking about the spirit and versus energy, did Jesus talk like that? So if I'm trying to be like him and talk like him and I'm a Christian, because that can get confusing is what I've heard from other people, too. If I'm talking to you about God and you're wanting to become a believer and I'm using language that isn't, I can't reference that back to the Bible and the word, then that's when it gets confusing. God's word isn't confusing. And so I need to be in line with his word and not with the world's word. Absolutely. You want to use the Bible when you're trying to talk about God because he, that language is in scripture. And, when, and then one of the things that's, uh, we start talking about new age and asteroids and meditation. The crazy thing is all that's in the Bible. Meditate day and night on this mm -hmm. word. Nothing in the universe was made without God. Even asteroids and astrology or astronomy, God made all of it. He's the God of the universe. Mm -hmm. He created this big old planet is spinning in space. I know for some reason we think that we're just like here. We're spinning 
in a big old space, just like all these other rocks. So why would he not be the god of an asteroid or god of, of astronomy? It took the wise men, they, saw, they, they found Jesus with a star. Okay? This, and then, and then uh, uh, Pastor talked about the day, the tribes of Issachar, they were known because they understood the times, the signs of the time. So all of that is scripture, but not them being God. God is the God of the universe. God is the God of this world. He's the God of this age. So use your word uh, to defend. And if you really want to get in apologetics, go to school and learn how to defend your faith. Okay? Uh, did y'all have a good time tonight? I think we did too.